the incentives that Paul ha has just listed for you from the Orphan, uh, Orphan Drug Act have been astoundingly successful in increasing the amount of attention paid to rare disease, the number of drugs and other therapies developed for rare diseases, the number of those therapies that have been approved by the FDA. Uh, we look forward to the moment when everybody in this room can say, we just got ours. <clears throat> so fast forward from 1983 with all these incentives to 2011. You know, you say, you've got all these wonderful um, incentives um, from the Orphan Drug Act. What's the, what's the current setting? We're in 2011. You look around and you see that, um, yeah, there's some, a, a you know, good number, an increasing number of orphan drugs uh, approved each year. But if you look at orphan drugs for kids, you see an abysmal vacuum. You take rare cancers, for example. In that um, almost three decades since the um, establishment of the Orphan Drug Act, you had 50 uh, therapies approved for adults with cancer. You had one therapy approved for kids with cancer. Um, and most, you know, there were a lot of other you know, rare pediatric diseases, like many of us represented in this room, that suffered the same lack of treatment at all. So um, with strong support from and strong encouragement from advocates like yourselves, uh, a group of uh, congressmen uh, and senators decided to act. Um, those, those strong, uh, the strong support and encouragement came from organizations such as uh, childhood cancer representatives, uh, the Every Life Foundation, um, our host today, uh, the National Organization for Rare Disorders, as well as children's hospitals, industry partners, and the list goes on and on. Um, so with that kind of support and encouragement, members of the House and Senate decided it was time to act. The result was that uh, congressmen like uh, Representative McCall, a Republican of Texas, Representative Butterfield, a Democrat of North Carolina, Representative Myrick, a Republican of North Carolina, and Van Hollen of Maryland, a Democrat, were joined by an impressive list of co-sponsors on the House side, and they decided to introduce what was called the Creating Hope Act of 2011. It, they had modeled it after an existing um, act um, that dealt with tropical uh, disease priority review vouchers. Um, and then uh, Senators Casey, a Democrat of Pennsylvania, and Brown, a Republican of Massachusetts, were joined by 11 other senatorial uh, co-sponsors and offered a counterpart Senate bill. That result resulted in the Creating Hope Act, uh, which was signed into law in 2012. As part of the package you've heard from Eric uh, about in the preceding panel, the PDUFA legislation of, of 2012, otherwise known as FDASIA, the F uh, FDA Safety and Innovation Act of 2012. Um, so how does this rare pediatric priority review voucher that was created in the Creating Hope Act of 2012 work? First, uh, a company that has successfully developed a therapy for a, a rare pediatric disease can, upon re receiving approval from the FDA, apply for and obtain what is called a rare pediatric uh, disease priority review voucher, which entitles that company, or entitles the holder of that voucher, uh, to a priority review, an accelerated review. What that means is, instead of waiting 10 months or longer to um, have action taken uh, on the application you've submitted, for approval, the FDA is enjoined to conduct that review within six months. Um, and, okay. Um, so how does uh, that incentivize a development of, our, of rare uh, pediatric disease treatments when we know that most rare diseases who apply for uh, approval of a therapy can apply for a six-month review? So what, what's the difference, right? Well, the difference is the company, let's say I'm a CEO of a drug company. I come to you and I say, I've, I've read your website. I see that your disease is one that our company wants to work on. We've got enough money, we think, to get into the clinic, start a clinical trial. We're going to be raising more money. 
Um, and um, we're going to need your help with recruitment. We're going to need your help with identifying the best clinicians and so forth. You go through that process with this startup company or small pharma. You get through the, the clinical trials, and, and darn it, it worked. You know, and you've got an application with good data to take to the FDA. You take it to the FDA, they approve. They see the data is good, they, they approve your, your, your first therapy. Uh, again, that company has already gotten their approval, right? They don't need a priority review voucher to get that drug approved. So they apply for one, they get the review voucher, they can then, they're, they're going to keep working on your disease, right? So they won't need a priority review, they can get that on their own merits. They can sell it to uh, another company that can use it to get a priority review of a common disease. And, and why is that an advantage? It's an advantage because, it's a huge advantage, because these guys developing drugs for common diseases are in a very competitive space. They're, months matter. Months mean a lot of money on the market. If they can be first to market, this priority review voucher is going to help them do that uh, by giving them re their review in six months rather than 10 or more. So, you know, and, and so does it work? It darn well does, because if you look at these three sales, Biomarin sold a, a priority uh, review voucher uh, that th they got from developing a therapy for MPS4 to Sanofi and Regeneron for $67 million. Uh, dollars. Retrofin sold to uh, Sanofi for $245 million. And that, uh, that, that first one that Biomarin sold was used successfully to get a cholesterol drug, not a, com not a, not a rare disease, right? Uh, called Preluent, uh, approved. Um, then Retrofin got $245 million from Sanofi. They have redeemed that voucher in, back in December, just a few months ago, to um, on a drug for diabetes, we'll find out if they're successful. Now these, and, and then finally the third one was sold by United Therapeutics to AbbVie for $350 million. Now these priority review vouchers don't help you if the data's not good. You know, they don't, you know, give you a break on, on data. You still have to have rock solid data, uh, um, but it does give you an advantage in the marketplace. If you can get to the marketplace, if you can be first to market, because you got that six month review, didn't have to wait 10 or 12, then you know, that's why they're paying the, these big bucks. So you can see it's, it's being successful. Another beauty of it is that it's not taxpayer dollars. This is budget neutral. You know, this, this is money they're getting from big drug companies, right? So it's imp very important to the small startup that's gonna come to you and, and offer help and ask for your help, because they can get big bucks. They get these big bucks, then they've got that much more money to work on your disease. Um, so it's, it's been, there are a couple of issues. There's a sunset provision in the original legislation called the Creating Hope, Hope Act. The sunset was set as when you issue your third voucher, which was done, obviously, uh, it was done last March, you only have a year left on the program. So the pro program sunset was to be this March, like in two weeks, March 17th of this year. So the Congress, who really, you know, they really believe in this program, went to the mat and said, okay, we're going to um, reauthorize this, this pr very important program, this is Center for Rare Diseases. And, and they, um, in the omnibus appropriations bill uh, in December, they moved the sunset from March 17th to the uh, end of September of this year, giving us most of the, the year to work out a reauthorization. Then the Advancing Hope Act by the same sponsors, including um, Congressman Butterfield, whose representative Saul Hernandez will be talking with you this afternoon, uh, went to the mat and said, okay, we're, that created hope, now we're going to advance hope. They, they offered a proposal called the Advancing Hope Act, and that would re permanently reauthorize this program. Well then, the 21st Century Cures Act comes along, they pull in that Advancing Hope Act, but they, uh, with its provisions to reauthorize, but they reauthorized it until December 31st, 2018. The bit, next big step is the Senate action of the committee you heard about this morning. Um, and they are scheduled to deal with, they're working on Medical Innovation Act, their counterpart to 21st Century Cures, 
On March 9th, the committee will deal with the rare pediatric disease priority review voucher program. You, you might want to pay attention to that. You might even want to advocate for it. Um, and that, that hearing takes place on, on March 9th. Um, the second issue is eligibility. I'll, I'll be very brief here because I know I'm out of time. Uh, if you look at the original act, um, and, and the, if you look at the law, basically, it says that a, a rare pediatric disease is one that primarily affects individuals aged from birth to 18. That sounds pretty straightforward, doesn't it? Well, um, it's not as straightforward as you might imagine. The FDA's draft guidance on that definition added the, an interpretation that was, uh, uh, yes, it's, um, it, it primarily affects individuals aged from birth to 18, which means to them that uh, more than 50% of your existing population right now that's got your disease is under 18. How many people in the room have a disease or representing a disease in which your kids really get sick, but they live past their 18th birthday? Yeah. And mine too. Uh, if they live substantially beyond their 18th birthday, you're gonna run into this problem where more than half of them are over 18. So by this interpretation, you would not be eligible for a pedi rare pediatric um, you know, priority review voucher. So here, here's what is, is on, ongoing right now. Um, that issue is being addressed and a lot of discussions are taking place. We'll have to wait and see first what the legislation says as, as you know, it, it gets through the Senate first and then a Senate House conference committee and is enacted into law. And then the FDA might consider issuing additional draft guidance or coming up with a policy that might address that. But we're, we're not there yet, but I'm just alerting you to that prospect. The, um, the final issue I'll raise is uh, the very understandable FDA concerns. Their concern is basically that if we got a, a deluge of these uh, priority review vouchers, they'd be enjoined to do priority review vouchers, or they'd be enjoined to do priority reviews in six months for a lot of diseases that are common diseases. You know, uh, the, you know, all the common diseases that had a voucher would come to them and say, now you've got to do my review in six months, not 10 or 12. And they wouldn't have the resources or the staff to accommodate that. Fully understand that. There are some provisions in the, in the law that are helping some. If you look at the three-year pilot period, there were only six vouchers issued. Uh, but I understand, we would all understand the FDA's concern here. Um, so we're going to have to address that. Uh, some of these provisions uh, would control the numbers. You, you, you can't have a, a, a chemical entity in the, in the drug that you're applying for a voucher with that has already been approved in some other condition. You can't be applying for an adult um, condition at the same time. Um, you know, so there are other controls, but you understand why the FDA would be concerned. And we'd be concerned for them. We want them to have the resources and, and the staff to do our reviews quickly and, and well. So, we so you can see the- We need to wrap up, Ron. Yeah, uh, Sorry. You can see it's a very important program. Uh, you can see that it's working. Uh, you might want to keep an ear out or mm -hmm. maybe a voice out as the Senate acts on March 9th. And then when you get the final legislation and if we get, um, more uh, draft guidance from the FDA, you might want to consider offering comments in that very nice system that Gayatri Rao told you about. So thank you for your attention, and we'll take any questions. Thank you. Oh, yeah.